like I, I this is all my life is ever going to be. This is it. I'm done. I'm 50. I'm 55. I'm 48. My tits have gravity. I don't look like I used to look anymore. I, you know, this is it. Well, okay. But is it though? Let's let's push back on that, right? So that's really what my work is about. My work is about helping people who feel uncomfortable or unwelcome in the concept of self-improvement to come to the table in a way that makes sense for them. Hey, midlifers, welcome to the Midlife Makeover Show. Are you ready to break free from your mundane midlife? Are you feeling trapped in a vicious cycle of rinse and repeat days? No matter if you're experiencing a divorce hangover, job burnout, or you just have the midlife blues, I got you. Hey, I'm Wendy, your hostess of the Midlife Mostest. I too was hit by midlife like a freight train. I too felt stuck in the same dull chapter. I wanted the clarity of how to create a new life beyond divorce and the courage to leave an unfulfilling career. But I kept telling myself that I wasn't worthy and it was just easier to stay in my comfort zone until I found a little secret, the freedom to live my life my way. In this podcast, you will learn how to achieve a vibrant midlife mind and body how to create solid relationships through love and loss, and how to create an awesome second half of life. Grab your grande latte, pop in your earbuds, and let's get this midlife party started. Welcome back to the show, everyone, and welcome to one of my favorite episodes ever. Seriously, it is so dang good. My conversation with our guest today really inspired me, not just on a personal level, but a professional level, and especially on a spiritual level. Her words move through me like sparkling spring water flowing through a riverbed. She is powerful, bold, bright, unapologetic, wise, and cool as shit. I actually listened to the replay of our interview three times just to capture the nuggets of midlife wisdom that I feature at the end of every episode. I could not decide what to pick. It was one mic drop after another. I did pick my number one nugget, though, and instead of reading it to you at the end of the show, I'm going to read it to you now. I thought of you and all my listeners when she said these words. And her message sums up why I began the show for you, for myself, and for anyone else out there needing a reminder of their greatness and their ability to create life on their terms. Here's my fave nugget from one of my fave shows. How much of your life Have you chronically underestimated yourself, your worth, your strength, your ability, and all the times when you said, that's not for me, I can't do that, I don't deserve that? How much of your life have you spent chronically doing that to the point when it is all you know? It sucks because you get to a point in midlife when you turn around and go, holy shit. I spent decades of my life, time that I will never get back, opportunities that I will never be able to claim because I so intensely underestimated myself. And then you just got to mourn because you got to let yourself feel sad for all the shit that hasn't happened because in some way or another, even if it wasn't your fault, you underestimated who you were. And to know that you are responsible for that in some way, then you have to go, okay, that was the first three decades of my life. And if I'm lucky to have two to three more decades, so let's just not do that. And if I don't do that, at least the second half of my life will be about believing in myself and not taking away from myself. Yes. I'm sure you can understand why that was my number one nugget. Let me introduce you to the beautiful woman behind those words. Our gorgeous guest today is Sarah Sapora, an inspirational speaker, plus size personal growth teacher, and author of the brand new book, Soul Archaeology, a totally 
doable approach to creating a self-loving and liberated life. Her greatest desire is for women of every size to feel empowered to begin the journey of living an authentic and empowered life on their terms. Self-improvement looks different for everybody and every body. It starts from the inside out. Without further ado, please welcome the sensational Sarah Sapora to the show. Enjoy. Everyone, welcome back to the Midlife Makeover Show. I know you're listening to me on the podcast and you can't see what I'm holding, but it's this hot off the press, gorgeous book, <laughs> Soul Archaeology, a totally doable approach to creating a self-loving and liberated life written by the gorgeous Sarah Sapora. Dun, dun, dun. Dun, dun, dun. And jazz hands, jazz hands. Jazz hands, jazz hands. Sarah, welcome to the show. Thank oh, but you. Let me just tell everyone, not only have I read this book and I highlighted the crap out of it, but I listened to her audiobook with her beautiful voice. Uh, driving from Mount Shasta to where did I say I'm now? Where am I? Oh, South Lake Tahoe yesterday. <laughs> and it, I was actually, I was actually glad to get stuck in traffic because I was like, oh, good. I can finish like listening to your book. So bravo, congratulations. You're Thank amazing. You. You're gorgeous. And Thank you're you coming so at us live from uh, from your mom's den. Yeah, I'm coming to you live. I am a 44-year-old woman coming to you live from my mother's den in Bay Ridge, Brooklyn, surrounded <laughs> by a sea of family photos and mustard paint and bagels and all the things that happen when you're a <laughs> middle-aged person that go back to your parents' house and find yourself stuck in a place that feels very familiar and very threatening to all the things you have learned over the last 30 years of life. That is where I am right now. Arrested uh, development. That's what it is. That's where I'm literally in the middle of right now. So welcome to my world right now, people. Thank you. It's so wonderful to be here. And welcome to the inside of my RV. Yeah, there you, know. you go. <laughs> welcome. So tell everyone a little bit more about you. Uh, well, my name is Sarah. I am a plus-size self-love mentor. I am a writer. I run body-inclusive personal growth events. And I lovingly say that I teach self-love to plus-size women who are old enough to remember life before the internet. Uh, and regardless of whether or not you're, you're plus-size, really, there is an entirely different shift in how we experience our life whether it was before or after Google and MySpace and all that sort of shit. So if you're listening to this now, I assume that you remember what life was like before you could Google everything and when you actually had answering machines and when you would turn around and say, I'll call you when I get home. Um, and, and if you have ever struggled with your self-esteem mm -hmm. or traded pieces of yourself away like currency mm -hmm. in order to feel more lovable, then mm. I got your back and we are peeps. And I am glad that you are listening here today because this, this is pain is universal. It doesn't belong to any specific person or type of person, right? And as long as these are things that you can understand in some way, which many of us can, like raise your hand yeah. if you have ever done shit trying to feel loved that you would never want to tell anybody about today. Yeah, exactly. Um, yeah. Then we're all here together. And, and, I'm not a fancy therapist. I don't have multiple degrees or anything. My superpower is vulnerability and being able to talk about really hard stuff in a way that has both tenacity and hope so that you know mm. that things can suck and be messy and sticky. Mm -hmm. And they can also be all at the same time. And that's what I aim to do. I aim to just help more people to come to the table of their own self-improvement. Because as long as we are here, as long as we are breathing, right? I know as we get older, shit gets harder, it gets harder to make change. It gets harder to envision doing things differently, right? But it's also really liberating and the greatest fucking work that you can do. And to turn around and start building, being powered 
by yourself for yourself in your 40s and 50s and it's the fucking greatest shit you'll ever do man like you have more of a stake and an understanding in life but also more power and more i mean it's just so beautiful and i don't want any of us to ever feel like the chance to do that has passed us by and so many oh, of us feel, word so, yeah yes. yeah so many of us feel like i i this is all my life is ever going to be this is it uh-huh. i'm done uh-huh. i'm 50 i'm 55 yep. 48. My tits have gravity. I don't look like I used to look anymore. I, you know, this is it. Well, okay. But is it though? Let's let's right. push back on that. Right. So mm-hmm. that's really what my work is about. My work is about helping people who feel uncomfortable or unwelcome in the concept of self-improvement to come to the table in a way that makes sense mm-hmm. for them. Well said. Thank you. I love listening to, I can listen to you all day. It's so good, right? I don't know, this is like a this is like a love bath. That's what it feels like. You want to know what? So when I was younger, I always used to think my, my voice was higher pitched, and I I thought I used to sound like Fran Drescher a lot, you know. And I and my New York accent was was heavier, although it was never really heavy because I'm a born and raised native New Yorker, New York, Brooklyn, blah blah blah. But um, at some point in time my voice sounded to be more peaceful. And I'm like, and I just think it's the most ridiculous thing in the whole world. But people are like, I love to listen to you speak. And I'm like, what kind of fucking crack are you on? I sound like, I don't know, like, but okay. If you want to hear me speak, let me, let me read to you. Let's talk. You know, (laughs) I'm telling you, like listening to your audio book yesterday, normally I can't listen to audio books when I'm driving this 25 foot RV across the country because I'll get like sleepy, but I was so into it the whole time. I was like, this is so oh good. Gosh. Thank so you. Listen, I, and I told you, I did highlight a ton of stuff yeah. and I literally started with the dedication. So that's oh how my good it is. Okay. <laughs> and, I'm, good. I, and I'm like a self-help snob. So like I've read all the self-help stuff, right? Uh, like that's my yeah. section at Barnes and Noble. Yeah. And, yeah, yeah. Oh, and let me just tell you though too. So as I was, I, I think I started to tell you this before, I was listening to the audiobook on the way and I was like, you know what? I want the physical book in my hands. And mm-hmm. I was like, how can I get this before I get to Lake Tahoe? I mean, there's not a whole lot down here. I looked on my phone for the Barnes and Noble. There's a Barnes and Noble in Folsom, California. Oh never <laughs> heard of it. Folsom, yeah. like, is that like Folsom Prison? Like what is it? Yeah. That? Yes, it is, isn't it? I'm pretty sure it is. No, I, yeah, so I called there and they said, yes, we have one copy left. And you and I was got like, Don't it? I got it. This is it. Yeah, yeah. I was so excited. I was like, oh, thank God I got it. So, uh, yeah, I mean, I mean, what are the chances, though? You know? So, so um, I am born and raised in New York City and I'm 44. So I put that into perspective because... Barnes and Noble and New York, like bookstores in New York are like kind of a thing, like in the 80s and the 90s. And so I grew up sort of around Union Square and my mother and I would just go to Barnes and Nobles and sit for hours. We would just read books. Right. We've been readers. I've been a reader my whole life. And so um, when I when I found that the book was going to be Barnes and Noble, I'm like this Mm -hmm is fucking cool. And <clears throat> for those of you who are don't have visual right now, the book cover has a a big smiling picture of me on it. And I did that for a reason, not because I wanted to see my own face on a book cover, um but because I remember being a little girl or a teenager or a college age Mm. student. I remember being a young person and going through Barnes and Noble and never seeing a single person that looked like me, never Mm. seeing a body that looked like mine. And if you have ever existed in a marginalized body of any kind, you know how important it is to see representation. And so when you go to the self-help section now, um, my boyfriend and I went the other night and we like had a little toast and we sat in front of the book. We went to go visit it. It was really sweet. I was going to ask you um, if you've seen it yet. Is we that did, like, yeah. like the coolest thing? Did you cry? It was. I, I To be honest, we had a, we had a bet going on who was going to cry first and he cried first. Aww. But then I sat there and I looked around 
Because when you write a self-help book, the publishers don't want your face on it because if your face is on it, it separates the reader from identifying with the book. And I said, I need you guys to trust me when I tell you that my reader needs to see this face because she needs to see a plus size woman being treated with the respect that anybody else would be treated with, right? On, on a book cover. And I remember looking at the stuff yep. in personal growth and there was Tony Robbins and there was all these big famous people. And sure enough, there was this clearly not, not super young, but like 40 something plus size woman with gray yep. hair and a big ass smile leaping off the page of the book. And I said, I think we accomplished a goal. And that is when I cried. Exactly. When I saw that in the self-help section, that is when I lost my shit. Yeah. I actually, I mean, I, 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 I've cried a few times reading the book, listening to the book. Happy, like, so proud of you, like proud of you, like going through the dark night of your soul and actually yeah. coming out the other side, like probably, I, I think, I don't know. I, and I feel like maybe even, even better than you probably could have ever imagined. I mean, it's oh, like, yeah, what, absolutely. what, like, and he, reading about George and oh, yeah. I think, well, you guys have to read, you guys have to read the book, but like, we all have a George in our life, no matter if that George is, you know, represents someone or something, right. There's all this, like, it, but that, and, and I preach this to my audience all the time. It's like, it's the shit in life that that's where, that's where you really learn about yourself. It's the yep. breakdown to the breakthrough. Like you could, like, there's so much beauty to it. Just like you were saying earlier about like midlife in itself. Like it is the prime time to go, you know what? What do you want? Like, what do so, I want in my life? What's really interesting yeah. about midlife, especially as a midlife woman, and I'm sure you guys have all had this thought or if not in some way, right? <clears throat> it's it's a massive reckoning and a really interesting combus, com combination of the most beautiful shit and the hardest shit because on one hand mm -hmm. you are you have never probably never been more emotionally agile and powerful and in touch with yourself and self-aware but at the yep. same point in time we're dealing with changes in our body and we're dealing with this inevitable unfortunate um that dissolution of how society sees our value as women right mm -hmm. so it's like holy shit i've never been more powerful my my sex drive has never been more on point my awareness and myself has never been greater and i have never been less valuable in society's eyes than i am right now and there's this massive reckoning of both birth and death at the same time and that that frankly is where the mm. juicy stuff in life comes right the juicy right. stuff in life comes when you can figure out ways to safely experience the really hard shit, because mm -hmm. the, the depth of power of ability that you have to experience the hard shit is going to be mirrored in how deeply you can feel the beauty when you feel it. If, if you're one of those mm. folks, I have been one who has anesthetized and numbed out for in their life for a variety of reasons or tools, whether it's drug, sex, food, whatever, you cannot feel the most beautiful shit when you are numbed out and you cannot feel the All hardest right. of pain when you are numbed out. Like I have a very vivid memory of like in my, in my mid thirties, uh, feeling so scared and so alone that I would I cry at night and I would just say, I'd rather have loved somebody for real and lost them than not than what mm. I feel right now, because at least then I'd know I was capable of love. At least then I'd know mm. I was capable of feeling, right? At right. least I know that my heart was capable of connecting yeah. to someone. And, and I don't mean to go off on a tangent, but what I'm trying to say, and I think what you said before mm. is that um, we need the shit in order to have the shine, like they yeah. have to go together. And, yeah. and the sooner you start to realize that life is not about avoiding shit, but just figuring mm -hmm. out the way to nail through it a little bit less yeah. unscathed, that's going to be a reflection of how, of how deeply you can feel the, the beauty when it comes your way. 
Yeah, so right. I've already said like if someone took away my tragedies and my trauma in life, I'd be because it was from like losing. Um, I lost my ex-husband. He was 26 years old. He passed away. My brother passed away at 49 through two divorces and all sorts of yeah. other shit that I've been through in my life. I am so, sounds so crazy to say it, but I'm so grateful that I went through it because I discovered more and more about myself and what I'm capable of. And I, I think that's what's so important to, to point out to everyone is that you're so much more capable than you realize. Like yeah, you're, absolutely. You're so much stronger than you know. Well, you know, like yeah. we're not trained to look to ourselves for answers. Everything right. in our society is basically designed to remove us from our own ability to critically think. And especially yep. if we think about personal growth and wellness and diet culture, which is all about buy another solution, buy another solution, buy another solution. And the reason that this book mm -hmm. is called Soul Archaeology is because it's not about buy another solution. It's about mm -hmm. no dig deep into your soul and pull and peel yep. off the layers of all the shit that you've learned. Because it is only when you do an archaeological dig of your soul one layer at a time, yep. will you actually reveal what is unshakable and unbreakable in you? But the answer is not buy my digital class, buy another planner, do another juice cleanse, do whatever you can to be the next after and the before and after picture that you think is going to solve everything. Yeah. And it's really strip that shit away, strip it, strip it away, strip that shit away. And strip that's where away. you, yeah, that's <laughs> where you will find yourself. I, this is super random, but I, I was on Instagram the other day and I came across, I don't know who it was, a news outlet that was doing a report on a woman who was going in for like a big Brazilian butt lift mommy makeover. And it mm. was how much she was putting herself through in order to feel like better about herself and in order to love herself more. And my first yeah. diet culture bells went off and went ding, 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 ding. Y'all realize it doesn't matter whether you change your hair, or change the zip code that you live in, change your glasses, change your boyfriend, change whatever, win or lose up or down 50 pounds. Like the shit that hurts you at one weight and one size and one place in life oh. is going to hurt you at another. And the sooner you realize that your shit is your shit and it's going to be your shit for the rest of your life, you might as well make friends right. with it and just keep getting comfortable with it because mm -hmm. you cannot outrun it. You cannot out fuck it. You cannot out eat it, change it. You can keep it at bay. But when you were young, did you ever play with like those water snakes? And they they were like penises oh, in your yeah. hand. Yeah. <laughs> and you squeeze the bottom of one side, and then the water and the eyeballs would go out the top. And then you would squeeze that side, and then the water and the eyeballs would go out the bottom, right? That's what your pain is like. You can squeeze one area, but then it's going to pop out the other. And then you can redistribute yep. the water again, and you can squeeze it a different area, and it goes away over here, but then it pops out over here. Right. So you can chase mm -hmm. your pain around every bucket in your life and and try to keep it at bay. But at the end of the day, it's your Almo and it's your reckoning. And you mentioned George and having a George. Let me tell you what that guy's what that means, guys. George in specific for me was a relationship that represented and encompassed all of my big super core wounds. And it was really hard because he was so fucking hot and, and we had so much great sex and chemistry and how, how I felt because of him, like who I thought he made me was exciting and vibrant and alive. And I was addicted to that. And I'll, and I have this moment in my life that I was like 30, 37, maybe, I don't know, something like that. And, and he had texted me and he said, what are you doing tomorrow? And I'm like, oh, I'm just going to deal with car bullshit and blah, blah. And he's like, no, I got you a ticket on the airplane. It leaves in three hours. Go now. And so I, I, I felt like I was out of like a, a, a rom-com with Hugh, Hugh Grant and Julia Roberts, and I threw things in my bag and I put dry shampoo in my hair and I got to the airport and there I am, this chunky, fat, 37, 38 year old girl running through the airport and I'm going, holy shit, this is my life. I'm living a movie. This is how 
happening. Oh my God, this is happening. Holy shit, this is happening. This is happening. This is like, and just the sense of feeling alive all because he made me that way. And then Mm. realizing that that was also the one relationship I had to learn how to walk away from. Because although it was Mm. the highest of the highs, the highest of the highs when they're that intense, usually come with the lowest of the lows because the highest of the highs feel that good because they're feeding into all of that trauma and wound shit, right? And you're getting all that satisfaction Mm -hmm. and everything. And I had to learn how to walk away from that. So what she's referring to is if you have a George, there's a relationship that has been in your life that has been the representation of all of the biggest things that you have to heal through. And so many of us have that. That, That's what she was referring to. I apologize for the random tangent. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. I know. That's, oh, that's so awesome. But really it's like the Georges in our lives. And I've had quite a few that are, they really become your greatest teachers. They really are trying to like, you don't think of it that way. Right. No, not then. It seemed like an evil teacher, but it's actually like, wait a minute. You actually led me back to my soul. Yeah. It was you that stood up and said, yeah, that you stopped abandoning yourself that's really what it came down to yeah and And i just want to say to you that him yeah yep yeah exactly yeah and i like you know your title a totally doable approach but it's also relatable like in some way like even hearing a lot of your story my story was like woven in it too and i was like oh yeah i can totally relate to this and having been abandoned as a child i real i'm gonna cry (laughs) I realized that I had abandoned myself and I was like, I kind of, I mean, I had in my audience has heard the story before of me laying on the bathroom floor, bawling my eyes out, midlife meltdown or whatever the hell you want to call it. And I was like, no more. Like it takes the same amount of energy or probably less for me to get up off my ass and do something with my life rather than just staying on the floor, abandoning myself over and over and over again. Like eventually you have to come to a point and go, I'm exhausted enough. Like, let me get my shit together. And I think, you know, at midlife, it's, it's a great time because you're old enough to know what did not work for you. The Mm -hmm. Georges in life that didn't work for you or anything that you attempted in life that did not work for you, but you're young enough to finally do something different and do something that will work for you. So that, that is, is a big tenant of, of what happens in this book, because a lot of times when you talk to people and like, Oh, I'm not happy. Well, just do things that make you happy. Well, fuck hard. If I knew it would make me happy, I would fucking do it. And if I knew it and I could do it, then clearly I'd be doing it. Right. And that is part of the thing is that like, sometimes you're so deep under your own pile of shit that you feel like you're responsible for making. And you're sitting there with one of those pink Baskin and Robin, you know, sample ice cream spoons, trying to dig yourself out that there's no way you could possibly envision an alternative version of your life where you feel any way different, but you do know what doesn't make you happy. So if you just start with what doesn't work for you and you follow that Mm -hmm. pain, then you will get there. And that is why the first thing that I always tell people is start where it hurts, right? Um, This book is really about self-abandonment, which is Mm -hmm. is what I lovingly refer to as all the ways we cock block living a self-loving life, right? All the ways we unknowingly (laughs) subconsciously get in the way of feeling the things that we actually really want to feel. But it's Mm -hmm. also about self-accountability and self-forgiveness and realizing that all of those ways that we've self-abandoned have gotten us to this point. And when, when I say self-abandonment guys, what I mean is that we are offered a moment in real time to either choose to have our own backs or abandon Mm -hmm. ourselves, usually for the sake of someone else or something else that keeps stasis, keeps calm, keeps the ship going, blah, blah, blah. So there are around 10 different common ways that we self-abandon. Everything from people-pleasing to um, uh, not trusting our own instincts and believing that everybody else knows something that we don't, to downplaying our own interests because somebody else might laugh at us, right? There are 10 Mm -hmm. common ways that we self-abandon, and everybody self-abandon in some way. Like, if you're not happy Trust me, you're doing something to contribute to it. Now, that doesn't mean that that shit's your fault. 
It's not your right. fault. Right. It's all you've known. Right. And we can become gold medal champion self the self abandoners that have done this shit for so long that we don't have any other way of even knowing how to exist. But the thing is, if you've gotten to where you've gotten to now and you're not feeling it, you got to do something fucking different, which means you've right. got to start self abandoning, even if you don't know what the alternative is. So the sooner right. you see how you self abandon, the sooner you can figure out something different, and that's the only way to start moving forward. You can turn around Mm -hmm. and back it up. You don't have to chase what makes you happy. You have to walk away from what doesn't work for you. And that's why I have a very specific edition of self-love. Self-love, it's not a bubble bath and it's not candles and it's not letting yourself get away with shit, right? Self-love is any thought that you think or any action that you do that helps you connect to your ultimate you. Now, your ultimate you, like if you're here, you live in self-help land, you've heard the expression higher self, greatest, blah, 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 fuck it, right? (laughs) Whatever. How I describe it is your ultimate you. This is really important, guys, because your ultimate you is not tied to your weight. It's not tied to your age, your boobs, your money, your your relationship, Mm -hmm. your boss babe status. Your ultimate you is about two things. One, your ability and your willingness to not bullshit yourself. So if you are self-abandoning, there is no fucking way you can possibly be your ultimate you. Your Mm. ultimate you is dependent on your ability to be self-aware with what you are feeling when you are feeling, including pain. The second thing your ultimate you is dependent on is being committed to following through with self-love based on what you've learned when you've looked at yourself. So if you are asking yourself, What's not feeling aligned for me right now? And you have the balls and the self-love and the tenacity and and the I'm worth this shit, the Mm self-esteem to follow through with creating some kind of change, then you're using self-love. So self-love is not just self. No, don't give me that. Self-love is active. Right. It's commitment and it's gritty Mm -hmm. and it's messy and Mm -hmm. it's ugly. And that's what all of this is about. Yeah. And I was even reading more about the self-love and it's also just even setting good, healthy boundaries for yourself. It's saying no when you, yeah. When you mean no, I'm like, I don't want to do that or I don't want to say that or act like that or whatever it is. So self, there's a lot in self-love. Like it's the, the term is kind of thrown (laughs) around a lot these days. Yeah. The term is thrown around like word on it. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Yep. It's self-love. Just love yourself. And mm. I know for me too, it's like, that's really what changed for me was to finally love Wendy for who she is. Right. Messy at all. Just who cares? And I'm like, right. I'm a recovering perfectionist. I don't mind admitting that. <laughs> yep. But I was someone that like, I wouldn't speak because I would be so nervous that if I said something wrong or I better not do this because what if it's not so freaking perfect and then they won't love me and then I'll get abandoned all over again. Wow. 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 And it's a story that we tell ourselves. Sure. Absolutely. And and you know, soul archaeology, right? It's, It's such a perfect metaphor for really digging and digging and digging until you get to the core, your ultimate you. And there, let's be real. It's not easy. No, it's not something that's done. And it's not fun. It's not fun. It's not pretty. It's not good for social media. It's not (laughs) shit that anybody else may understand, but it's not for them to understand. Right. Listen, yeah. especially as women, we spend so much of our life being performative for the sake of other people, whether we're faking our orgasms because we don't want our partners to know that they can't figure out how to get us off. And we might actually need more to help us get there. And we don't want to assert that because that makes us demanding or whether it's right. doing what our parents say or not telling our bosses that or whatever. Like women are perfectly primed self-abandoners for people pleasing. Right. Yeah. But yeah. It's not, self-love is not performative. Mm -hmm. Self-love is personal and it's intimate and it's only about ourselves. Now it may impact other people in a positive way, of of course, because when you are showing up more fully, Mm -hmm. truly as yourselves, that may piss some people off, but it will also liberate others, right? But is the point of life to be lived for the sake of others or is the point of life to to be lived in order to serve yourself? Now, I think this is an important caveat because Self-love is not the same thing as being selfish. And Mm self-love is also not the same thing as bucking off systems and communities. 
all of mm-hmm. which I think are very valuable and important to mental health, right? Communities right, right. and and social systems, although some of them are unaligned, are, are very important to mental health and well-being. And we see that all the time because there's never been a higher rate of suicide in young people. And we've never been less connected mm-hmm. to physical communities and more dependent on internet, non-real life communities than ever, right? But that right. being said, you can participate in systems and communities and, and greater circles of, of life while being true to yourself and while honoring yourself. Right. In fact, your experiences with those systems and communities and greater greater structures will be even more awesome yeah. because of your ability to show up for yourself. Yeah. And it's practice, right? Like it's, again, like doing all the work and all the digging, getting to the ultimate you is not something that's done overnight. And also, so it takes practice of that self-love. I still do it today. Like I'll have moments where like that little critic in my head will pop out and I'm like, rah, rah, rah. And I'm like, oh my gosh, no, I, <laughs> we're not having yeah. that. So you have to just, like, it goes back to awareness, right? When you become more and more aware of it, of how you treat yourself and how you talk to yourself, then you can correct it. And over and over and over again, and eventually the self-love becomes a habit. It's almost hard to not love yourself, right? Yeah. And I mean, self-love is a muscle. about it? Yeah, right, right. It's a muscle you have to learn how to strengthen. Yep. And then I feel like it, life becomes more effortless and you, you can just flow through life rather than having to constantly process stuff in your head all the time. Is this right or wrong or this or that? Or it's like, you can just, be. You can just be Sarah. You can just be Wendy. You can just be who you are and love. Even the times, like I always say, I'm like, there's no mistakes in life, just retakes. Like so, yeah. and, and things happen in life the way that they're supposed to happen. And you can embrace the shit that comes along because there will be more shit, right? I mean, there's going to be, I think, yeah. yeah, I think it's not that it's not that it, life gets easier. Mm-hmm. Right. If, if if your goal is for life to be easy, then you're not going to yeah. be living. A, you're not going to be practicing self love. What happens is yeah. that your life becomes more clear. So when you right. are prioritizing self love and doing what you can to serve your ultimate you, you are doing what I call living a self loving life. Now mm-hmm. you are either living mm-hmm. a self loving life or you're self abandoning. Those are the only two choices. You can either serve yourself with self-love or you can self-abandon. That's brutally clear. It's not easy and it's not fun, but it's very clear. So Mm -hmm. it's not that life gets magically easy. It's just that it becomes easier for you to see the pathways to take. Yes. And, and, you know, it's like, it's like in that movie, do you remember a beautiful mind? Like however many years ago when Russell Crowe was like seeing messy equations and then they all started to like come into gear. Well, the more you exercise your muscle of self-love, the easier it is for you to look around and filter out the code in what you're seeing. Mm -hmm. The easier it is, it becomes for you to look at it and say, Ooh, this is going to work for me this is not going to work for me. doesn't mean it's going to be fun when you separate yourself from the things that aren't fun for you, but it means it becomes easier for you to spot it. You get more agile and more well-versed at serving yourself. Yeah. Right. Yeah. The more connected you are to your soul, then you'll see things through your soul rather than through your old self with all the old limiting beliefs and all that crap. Exactly. Yep. So, so you teach retreats too, which I love. I do. Yes. Um, I've been running events of different sizes since 2017. Um, And for the last few years, I've been running what I call a retreat, which most people think is a combination of the word vagina and treat. And I'm not (laughs) mad that people think that. And so I let them run with that. But it's not vagina treat. It's really vacation retreat. Retreat. Because... (laughs) Part of the challenge that I have with self-help is that so much of self-help takes itself so fucking seriously. And I don't like that. I feel like when self-help requires you to drink green juice when you, when you don't, and when self-help holds you to this highest standard of performative diet culture, self-help that's done in order to elevate you at the sake of looking down at other Mm -hmm. people, then self-help isn't meeting people where they're at. 
right? I mean, like you have to be able right, to right. Yeah. understand that all human, first off, all humans exist and we all deserve to feel greater exactly as we are. So meet people where they're mm-hmm. at and move them forward. And so a vacation retreat exists to me because while you're doing the deep soul work, you also need to be able to laugh like really laugh. And if you can't dig deep and cry about your core wound and also make a dirty joke in the same five minutes, then that's not the kind of (laughs) self-help that works for me, right? Because that's the thing with life, right? Life is a mix of the high and the low, the good and the bad, the messy and the sticky and hilarious at the same time. So I create these Mm -hmm. retreats, vacation retreats, because in one day, I want you to be able to feel blissful sun and laugh your ass off. And then three hours later, I I want you to have a moment of reckoning where where you're looking at parts of your body that you've, you've never been able to embrace. And you're, and you're, you're offering yourself forgiveness for the way you've judged yourself. Like those things have to go Mm -hmm. hand in hand because otherwise, yeah. Oh man. Okay. So you were, you said you were driving from Mount Shasta years ago. I went to a lovely, lovely uh, retreat in Mount Shasta and it was really beautiful. And it was vegan and I'm not vegan. And I remember um, I snuck beef jerky and diet peach snapple into the retreat because I'm like, I can't do this for however many days. And I appreciate people who are vegan, but that's just not me. Uh, yeah. And so by day two of all the deep work and the green juice, I remember one other person and I were like, that's it. We're going to get hamburgers. Don't tell anybody. And we drove to town and we found the one Burger King in Mount Shasta, like right off the highway. And we're like, we're going to Burger King. Don't tell anybody, right? <laughs> yes, I know exactly where that's you. at. That you place do. Is it's, the one, yeah. it's the one burger, it's the one fast food in, in Shasta, which is not a fast food uh-huh. town. But that, that's the point, right? You guys, look, yes, your your growth and your evolution is a serious thing. And it's a serious thing right. because you you are a creature of beauty and therefore you deserve to take yourself seriously. You deserve to treat yourself seriously, mm. right? But the process of growth is human and messy and sticky and really fucking ridiculous. So don't think for a moment that if you that, that your growth cannot involve absolute absurdity of, of realizing your shit is falling apart and maybe wanting to emotionally eat an entire bag of Oreos and at least rub them all over your face at the same time as wanting to like apologize to your former partner for the way you've done this and that and writing a letter to yourself. Like all of those things go hand in hand and that yeah. shit makes for terrible social media. So just realize that that's what actual real growth is. Real growth is really yeah. messy and sticky and and it's mm-hmm. it's also very human. Yeah. I love that. And plus you even talked about in your book about self-forgiveness and just forgiving yourself for anything in the past and how you're feeling and what you're going through and, and just yeah. embracing all of you. Right. I yeah. think you even mentioned yeah. about writing a self-forgiveness letter. I did. Yeah. So, yeah. um, it came to a point. Uh, so for anybody looking for age perspective, I did not realize that I actually did not help have self-esteem until I was like 40. Like that was the first Mm -hmm. time that I realized that I had lived my entire life based on other people's definitions of me. And I didn't know who I was. So Mm -hmm. um, there came a point in my own personal soul archaeology where I became so blatantly aware of all the ways that I self-abandoned and all the men and all the tools and all the things and all the stuff. And it was just so heavy Mm -hmm. that somebody reminded me that I love that um, if I was going to recognize all those things that had happened and if I was capable of seeing that that I should also be capable of giving myself some forgiveness for that as well too Mm -hmm. because all those things that I did although I was angry at myself for them they got me to where I am now like they got me to this moment they were survival techniques and skills that brought me Mm -hmm. here so at least they did that trick so I might as well just forgive myself for them and just move forward because otherwise I'm going to keep carrying them on my back and that that weight is just going to follow me through every choice Mm -hmm. I continue to make excuse me. So I did, I wrote Mm. uh, a letter of self-forgiveness that was multiple letters. And I sat there probably without a bra on crying my eyes off. I wrote one to my dad. I wrote one to my dead ex-boyfriend. I wrote one to my, my current partner that Mm. I had just separated from. I wrote one to all the different things. I, I, 
I apologize to myself for um, for the men that I that actually wanted to be nice to me. And I tried to fuck them because I couldn't understand Mm. why somebody would want to be nice to me. I apologize to myself for abusing Mm. food. And then I just I just let it all out for every time I meant to send a thank you note and I never sent a thank you note for every time I bought a $700 pair of Christian Louboutin shoes on 30 grand a year and then I threw them away or lost them because I didn't like myself enough to keep track of my shit right like Mm. I just put it on paper and I was like that's it we're done we're done sometimes the best thing to do is just let it out just let yeah, it all I out. Just, better I out just, than in. I had right? better out, better out than in. So Shrek says, "Yeah, I just I had to have the courage to see all those things and actually write them out and name them, and then I just was like, okay, we're done. We're now gonna we're now gonna define ourselves based on what we want to birth now instead of what has had mm. to die." Yeah. I want to read your dedication because I just thought it was like, I did. I like, I cry just by reading your dedication. I was like, I'm only on the first page Uh, (laughs) for every chubby child convinced they could never be enough for those who were underestimated by others and by themselves for everyone who has ever felt invisible for my mother who never gave herself the love she deserved. Let's learn it now together for my dad and how we've grown. I love you. Yeah. Oh, that is um, so awesome. There's a lot there. How, how much of your life, you personally and you listening, just pause and think about this for a second. How much of your life have you chronically underestimated yourself, your worth, mm-hmm. your strength, your ability, all the times when you said, mm, that's not for me, I can't do that, I don't deserve that. Um, how much of your life have you spent chronically doing that to the point where it is all you know? Mm. And and that sucks, man. It sucks because you get to a point like in your midlife when you turn around, you go, holy shit, I spent decades of my life, time that I will never get back opportunity that I will never be able to claim again because I so intensely underestimated myself. And then you just got to mourn. You got to mourn because you got to let yourself feel sad for all the shit that hasn't happened because in some way or another, even though it's not your fault, you underestimated who you were. And then yeah. to know that you're responsible for that in some way, it's like, no. and then you just got to go, okay. So that was the first three decades of my life. And if I'm lucky, I have two to three more. So let's just mm. not do that now. Let's just, let's just. Let's just not do that. Doesn't matter what we actually do. Let's just not do that. And if I don't do that, then at least this part of my life, this second half of my life, it's it's gonna be yeah. believing in myself and not taking away from myself. And if that's all we do, that's pretty fucking good, guys. That's pretty good. I just love you. You're so cool. <laughs> I just love you too, new friend. <laughs> I just love you. Well, and just like you <laughs> said earlier, maybe it was in the book, I don't remember, but it's that willingness and that commitment. Making that yeah. commitment to your to your whatever you want we want to call it, to the higher self or yeah. in in for your own self-love, making that commitment and getting up off that floor, right? And going, yeah. you know what, damn it, let's go live a good life. You deserve yeah. it, right? That's it. it doesn't have to be a great life. It just has to be good on your terms. Remember, yeah. guys, you're either going to be exactly. self-abandoning or you're going to be self-loving. And it's okay if you yeah. go through years where it's harder to self-love than not. And you mm-hmm. may go through a couple of years where you're really abandoning and it's hard to find yourself. The good news is every day is a chance to come back to serving yourself with self-love. Self-love does not have an expiration date. You don't run out of the opportunity. Like if you're alive and you can breathe, you can do something self-loving. So 
even if you fall away, you can come back. It's like fucking ping pong. If you it goes the other way, it bounces back. Eventually, if you're here, you can choose something new until the mm-hmm. hour before you die and you're no longer here, hopefully a long way away. You can choose something more self-loving if you want to. It's not easy, yeah. but it is simple. Mm. It's not easy, but it's simple. Okay. Yeah. So do it or don't. It's okay. Either way, you know why? It's your fucking life. Do whatever the fuck you want. <laughs> you shouldn't have told me it was okay to say fuck, by the way. Yeah. <laughs> the other day I was recording something and they told me that I couldn't say fuck. They said and I bet like, you had a hard time speaking. You were probably well, like, first, first off, I will tell you that many years ago I got hired to do an event, a nonprofit event for preteen girls. And they're like, we love you, Sarah, but can you watch your language? I was like, no problem. I got this. And I really did because I I play it up because I joke about it because it's funny. So I want you to know, I did with those couple hundred girls. I never cursed once and it went great. But at this other (laughs) one, instead of saying, fuck, I went, and he's gay. I like that. And then they just sort of laughed. So every time I wanted to say it, I went, and now we go, and he's gay, yourself. And that was entertaining. So then I did my job, right? (laughs) I can oh I can gosh. do We're it if needed. I can do it if needed. Yeah. Uh, so everyone, please make sure you go get this book or listen to it. You can go on Audible. It only takes like five seconds to get on there or go to the book or my God, you can get books everywhere now, right? You can, um, yeah. Where can I think we it's find a good you? audio book, by the way? I think it is. Is you it like listening to audio books. Yeah. yeah. Um, where can you find me? And- you can find me on my website sarahsapora.com s-a-r-a-h-s-a-p-o-r-a.com and all of the links are there all the socials all the book links all all of it um it is in one handy dandy fun place because i am handy dandy and fun <laughs> <laughs> we have a lot in common we're handy dandy and fun yeah are you are you a fun Thank little you, nugget of awesomeness yeah yeah uh, and you know what's funny because i know you use the word nugget and at the end of every show, <clears throat> I do the nugget of love wisdom. So like I'll listen back to this show and then I pick my top seven nuggets of life wisdom. But I'll tell okay. you, I'm I'm gonna struggle with seven. It's gonna be like uh, me highlighting the crap of your book. I'll be why, like highlighting the why crap. Why is it seven though? Here. Why is it seven nuggets and not oh, eight no. or nine? Like where did the number seven come from? Sometimes I'll do eight. Sometimes I'll do eight. With okay. yours, I'm probably gonna have a hundred. It's going to be uh, insane. Well, you can have as many nuggets as you want. I hope you have the most delicious nuggets and they're tasty uh, and snackable and fun uh, size. Uh, and no, no, no. Listen, um, I think you're amazing. And I think we need to hug in real life. And maybe I'll come and meet you in Portugal because I love it in Portugal. And um, yeah, to all the crazy re- people. We could do a retreat. I would do one. We'll okay, do when party. I was in college. When I was in college, I was like a child, like a baby baby. And I went to Portugal before all the Americans started going there and before it was cool. And I went to the Algarve and then I rented a car and I drove up the coast of Portugal. Lord knows how I survived, but I did. Yeah. So I would go back to Portugal in a heartbeat. It was so beautiful. Yeah. Oh, my God. I'm coming to visit you. I'm inviting myself to visit. Just letting you know. Thank you so much for everything. I'll come and I'll bring... I'll come to your house and I'll bring you the best snacks in Portugal and we can talk all day long and see the sunshine and talk to people who want to talk to us and run a retreat and do all the fun stuff. Oh, thanks, Sarah. Thank you. I really appreciate it. Thank you for your time today and thank you for listening, everyone. And now for the nuggets of midlife wisdom from today's show. Number one, so many of us feel like, is this all my life is ever going to be? My tits have gravity. I don't look like I used to. And this is it. Or is it? Come to the table of your own self-improvement. Number two, midlife is a massive reckoning and an interesting combination of the most beautiful shit and the hardest shit. Number three, figure out ways to safely experience the really hard shit. The depth of power of your ability to experience the hard shit is going to be mirrored in how deeply you can feel the beauty of it. We need to feel the shit in order to feel the shine. I love that. (laughs) Number four, we are not trained to look to ourselves for answers. 
Everything in society is about buying another solution. Instead, dig deep into your soul and peel off all the layers of shit that you have learned. Do an archaeological dig of your soul one layer at a time. Number five, the sooner you realize that your shit is your shit and it's going to be your shit for the rest of your life, you might as well make friends with it and get comfortable with it. Number six, start where it hurts and start with what you know does not make you happy. Number seven, self-love is any thought that you think, any action that you do that helps you connect to your ultimate you. And because Sarah said I can have more than seven nuggets of midlife wisdom, (laughs) here is number eight. Your ultimate you is dependent upon your ability to be self-aware with what you are feeling when you are feeling it, including pain. And it is being committed to following through with self-love based on what you've learned when you've looked at yourself. And finally, number nine you are going to be either self-loving or self-abandoning. Choose self-love or not. It's up to you. OMG, that was a mic dropping episode. Please, please, please go to sarahsapora.com. That is S-A-R-A-H. S-A-P-O-R-A dot com. All the links will be in the show notes. And get a copy of her new book, Soul Archaeology. You you guys heard it. I've read it. I've listened to it. It's amazing. It's available on her website, Barnes & Noble, uh, Audible, or any other cool place that sells books. Check out her upcoming retreats too, or excuse me, her (laughs) vetreats, her vacation retreats. As always, I appreciate you being here. I will chat with you on Monday from Malibu. Have a great day. Did this podcast inspire you, challenge you, trigger you to make a change or spit out your coffee laughing? Good. Then there are three ways you can thank me. Number one, you can leave a written review of this podcast on Apple iTunes. Number two, You can take a screenshot of the episode and share it on the social media and tag me, Wendy Valentine. Number three, share it with another midlifer that needs a makeover. You know who I'm talking about. Thank you so much for listening to the show. Get out there and be bold, be free, be you.